When's the last time you didn't feel enough? If you relate to this question, you want to check out our podcast, Authentically Us. Yes, guys. Our podcast, Authentically Us, is where we talk about what it means to be authentic in everything that you do, in every space that you occupy. Tony and I created this podcast to create a space um, to talk about just who we are, our experiences, and just things that we are going through. Yes. So come join us with the journey as we figure out what it means to be authentic together. Rack your look for summer now at Nordstrom Rack and save up to 60% on brands you love. We've got them. Rag and Bone, Vince, Stuart Weitzman, Calvin Klein, Kurt Geiger London, Madewell, Steve Madden, and Adidas. Score great brands, great prices every day at Nordstrom Rack. What will you find? Breezy dresses, easy tops, designer bags and sunglasses, sandals, swim, and activewear, plus updates for your family and home. Get summer's best for less, up to 60% less, today at your Nordstrom Rack store. M-S-W Media. News Daily Beans, Daily Beans. Daily Beans, Daily Beans. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Tuesday, July 4th, 2023. Today, Trump's former communications director says Donald showed classified documents to people on the Mar-a-Lago dining patio. A civil rights complaint has been filed against Harvard's legacy admissions policy. A federal court has enjoined Florida's new voter suppression laws. And Israeli forces launch a major operation in the West Bank, killing at least eight. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hello. Happy hot dog day, my friend. Well, thank you to you as well. Normally us lesbians don't celebrate the hot dog day, but today I'm going to. <laughs> I like to call it hot dog day. That's just, that's, that's what it is for me. <laughs> so. That's really funny. Yeah. I, I do think it's funny that uh, it's hard to celebrate Independence Day when a large majority of our citizens don't have equal protections or rights as others. So yeah, it is, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard for me to do that as well. Yep. 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 All right. Well, we have uh, a lot of news to get to on Hot Dog Day, and we're going to have the good news a little bit later in the show. And uh, I hope everybody is having a relaxing holiday, at least hopefully getting some time off work or maybe getting out outside outdoors. I think maybe we're going to try to go to a baseball game. That would be pretty cool. Nice. But uh, anyway, however you're celebrating, happy holiday. And we'll we'll get we'll get the news in your ears. We're still here on the holidays. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. First up from Helen Holmes at the Daily Beast, now picked up by MSNBC, by the way, Stephanie Grisham, former communications director and press secretary under the former guy, told MSNBC's Alex Witt that Trump had shown classified documents to visitors at Mar-a-Lago, which, as we know, is his Palm Beach resort. Quote, I watched him show documents to people at Mar-a-Lago on the dining room patio. That's what Grisham told Alex Witt, quote, so he has no respect for classified information, never did, to be showing classified documents to people who haven't gone through the extreme vetting that you go through to get a clearance. It's, you know, it's a disservice to the country, but it also puts people in danger, potentially. Yes, it does, Stephanie. And Steve Bennon is writing for MSNBC as part of that same segment on Alex Witt, which MSNBC has posted online. Trump's former press secretary also said that he was loose with sensitive documents. Grisham added that the former president's willingness to share classified information with those who haven't received security clearance is a disservice to the country, as as she said, and puts people in danger potentially. And to be sure, this is a relatively vague account. Grisham says she's personally seen Trump show sensitive information to people at a -a Mar-a-Lago dining room patio, but we don't know which documents or who might have seen them or when such incidents might have occurred. Now, I remember when she was on the patio, And he was sending missiles into Syria and showing everybody some sort of documents. And people were leaning over him with phones to 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 like give light to the documents so that she could see them. Phones like probably taking photos of the anyway. Grisham's account is easy to believe because there's so much recent history that dovetails with her claims. Here are 10. Now, the thing about, you know, the dining room patio incident is he was president at the time. And here's 10 other examples that MSNBC lists of Trump being loose with secrets during his presidency. Coming in at number 10, 
In May of 2017, Trump had a chat with Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte in which the Republican, Trump, shared information about dispatching two nuclear submarines off the coast of the Korean Peninsula. By one account, Pentagon officials were in shock over Trump's willingness to share that information. We never talk about subs, three officials told BuzzFeed, referring to the military's belief that keeping submarines' movements a secret is key to their mission. All right, number nine. I feel like I'm doing the Sports Center top 10 right now. <laughs> In September 2019, during a photo op at an event in the U.S.-Mexico border, the president seemed eager to boast to reporters about detailed technological advancements in border security. It fell to Lieutenant General Todd Semonite, the acting head of the Army Corps of Engineers, to interject, sir, there could be some merit in not discussing that. Now, if you remember, Semonite <laughs> was the cool guy who set up all the hospitals during COVID. All right, coming in at number eight, in July of 2019, Trump had an unsecured conversation with U.S. Ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sundland. He was part of the whole Rudy shadow. Oh, I remember. Mm -hmm. While the ambassador was in a Ukrainian restaurant within earshot of others, in which Trump sought information on Ukraine, helping target the president's domestic political opponents. Larry Pfeiffer, former senior director to the White House Situation Room and former chief of staff to the CIA director, said of the call, the security ramifications are insane. Uh, number seven, in February 2018, Trump ignored the pleas of many U.S. officials and recklessly declassified information on the so-called Nunes memo in hopes of advancing a partisan scheme. Number six, in February 2017, Trump discussed sensitive details about North Korea's ballistic missile tests with Prime Minister of Japan at Mar-a-Lago in the dining room in view of wealthy civilians and customers. Now, in early October 2019, this is number five, Trump publicly discussed American nuclear weapons in Turkey something U.S. officials have traditionally avoided disclosing. And number four, August of 2019, Trump published a tweet about a failed Iranian launch, which included a detailed photo. As MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell reported, it wasn't long before experts marveled at Trump's recklessness with that classified photo. And number three, in October 2019, Trump needlessly blurted out all kinds of tactical and operational details about the al-Baghdadi mission in Syria. As NBC News reported at the time, quote, a few of those colorful details were wrong. Many of the rest were either highly classified or tactically sensitive, and their disclosure by the president made intelligence and military officials cringe, according to current and former U.S. officials. Number two with a bullet. In 2020, Trump disclosed the existence of a secret nuclear weapons dash program to Bob Woodward, to the surprise of national security insiders. And number one, and this is my favorite. Just four months into Trump's presidency, he welcomed Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Russian Ambassador to the U.S. Sergei Kislyak into the Oval Office and shared with them Israeli sensitive Israeli classified information, a visit that was never fully explained. Now, at this point, there is a definitive evidence that bolsters the observations Grisham made on the air. But given everything we've learned about how the former president treats sensitive documents, is it, is it, is it really that difficult to believe? MSNBC no. asks. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I agree. My goodness. All right. This one's from the Post AG, a civil rights group. And I love this. This is yes. when you, if you take away the rights of a protected class or things that protect protected classes, if you will, so they have equal opportunity in this country, they're going to, we're okay, let's go after one of the reasons it was put in place in the first place. And I know that didn't make sense, but you'll get it when I read the story. <laughs> a civil rights group announced Monday that it has petitioned the federal government to force Harvard University to stop giving a boost to children of alumni in the admissions process. And this is another sign of the mounting pressure on prestigious schools to change their policies following last week's Supreme Court ruling that rejected race-based affirmative action. Lawyers for Civil Rights said it filed the complaint with the Education Department alleging that legacy admissions, what they do at Harvard, they violate federal civil rights law because they overwhelmingly benefit white applicants and disadvantage those who are of color. Now, the complaint came days after the high court struck down race-conscious admission policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The landmark ruling on Thursday declared that those policies a form of affirmative action the court had previously allowed in the interest of assembling a racially diverse student body, well, that they violate equal protection guarantees under the Constitution. The complaint was filed on behalf of Chica Project, African Community Economic Development of New England and the Greater Boston Latino Network. An education department spokesman said Monday, and I quote, the Office for Civil Rights does not confirm complaints 
Our list of open investigations updated monthly is available here and gave everyone an opportunity to go see them. Selective colleges and universities nationwide are scrambling to review and, if necessary, adjust their admissions practices in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling. Documents made public through the Supreme Court case. They revealed the magnitude of the legacy boost for Harvard applicants. That's one of the things that came out of this case. About 34 percent, 34 percent of applicants from the United States who were children of Harvard alumni were admitted from 2009 to 2015. This is what the court's records showed. That was far higher than the overall 6% admission rate for non-legacy mm. applicants. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad. Now, this isn't uh, a lawsuit yet. It right. It's a, a civil rights complaint. So we'll see where it goes. But I imagine more of these will be happening in short order, including not just with the affirmative action ruling, but with the LGBTQ plus 303 creative website ruling, which is oh, now yeah. under, under a lot of scrutiny. Uh, Neil Kachal has called for the attorney general in Colorado to look into that because the whole thing was predicated on a, on a lie. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll keep, we'll keep an eye on it for you. Also from the Washington post, about a thousand Israeli soldiers backed by drone strikes stormed Jenin on Monday, targeting a militant command center. This is in, in the West bank in the most expansive Israeli military operation in the occupied West bank in two decades two decades. The assault marked the start of an extensive counterterrorism effort, quote unquote, centered on the densely populated Jenin refugee camp. And that's according to Israeli officials. At least eight people were killed, 80 injured, according to the Palestinian health ministry, with 17 in critical condition. The Israeli defense forces, the IDF, says the operation w- will continue indefinitely. Gunfire, drones and explosions were reported throughout the day by residents and in videos posted on social media. Residents reported receiving text messages from Israeli numbers that warned them to stay inside for their protection. Separate messages directed at militants advised them to surrender yourself for your safety and the safety of those around you. Israeli troops remained in the camp into the night as aid groups warned of worsening humanitarian conditions. Ambulances had difficulty traveling on many streets, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent, and at least some camp residents were without water or electricity. An IDF official said the military did not intentionally cut the utilities and would work to repair the lines. Hmm. The use of air power and a brigade sized force in the assault represents a significant military escalation in the northern West Bank, which has been targeted by frequent commando style Israeli raids this year. The clashes have grown more intense in recent months. Among them was a firefight in Jenin on June 19th that killed five Palestinians. A U.S. built Apache helicopter gunship was used to help evacuate Israeli soldiers caught inside the camp. The first time Israel had turned to air power in the West Bank since the uprising known as the Second Intifada in the early 2000s. The Israeli attacks Monday began shortly after one in the morning, destroyed what the IDF said was a militant command center that served as a hub of planning, weapon storage and communications. The building was surrounded by residential blocks and several facilities used by the United Nations Agency responsible for aiding Palestinian refugees. The operation bore hallmarks of Israel's regular missions against Islamist factions in the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, featuring airstrikes and no fixed end time, along with substantial military resources. Now, Egypt and Jordan, Arab neighbors that have relations with Israel, condemned the operations and called on the international community to intervene. In a sign of regional tensions, Israeli planes conducted airstrikes near Homs, Syria, on Sunday, according to the Syrian army, and an anti-aircraft missile that was reportedly launched from the area, exploded over central Israel. So we'll keep an eye on the escalating violence and tensions in the West Bank. All right. Thank you, A.G. And last in this segment, a federal court has enjoined Florida voter suppression laws. Now, I'm going to go a little slower because this is confusing at the beginning. This is from the judge's decision. This case arises from Florida's latest assault on the right to vote. Plaintiffs moved to preliminarily enjoin two amendments to Florida statutes, One new provision bars non-citizens from registering citizens to vote, thus discriminating based on alienage, one of the most questionable classifications in equal protection jurisprudence. The other exposes individuals working for third-party voter registration organizations to felony prosecutions for retaining voter information without telling them to whom the prohibition applies, what they can retain, and when they can retain it. Florida may, of course, Regulate elections include the voter registration process. 
Here, however, the challenge provisions exemplify something Florida has struggled with in recent years, namely governing within the bounds set by the United States Constitution. Apparently, they've been struggling with that. Imagine when state government powers threatens to spread beyond constitutional bounds and reduce individual rights to ashes, the federal judiciary stands as a firewall. The free state of Florida is simply not free to exceed the bounds of the United States Constitution. Period. The end. This case was brought by Mark Alias's team on behalf of the Florida State Conference of Branches and Youth Units of the NAACP, Equal Ground Education Fund, Voters of Tomorrow, Disability Rights Florida, Alianza for Progress, Alianza Center, Unidos U.S., and Florida Alliance for Retired Americans. There's a big crew behind this. They sued Florida Secretary of State Cord Byrd, Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody, and Florida's 67 county supervisors of elections. Florida is tired of being voter suppressed. Yeah, and and hats off to Mark Elias and and the democracy docket. Um, Just another another win here. So they're enjoined from those two provisions. And to think that they were trying to make it a felony for non-residents to register citizens to vote. Yeah. Like, what? I mean, that's how, like, how is that? I love their, they're like, the free state of Florida isn't free to shit all over the Constitution. Sorry. <laughs> I know. That was my favorite line in the story. You can't do this shit. Yeah. And that's what the judge ruled. So they are uh, preliminarily enjoined from enacting those laws. And we'll keep an eye on that for you, too. And if you're not following Mark Elias and Democracy Docket, you definitely need to, because the work that they're doing is extraordinary in protecting voter rights. Um, You know, as he says, we can't organize our way out of voter suppression. We can't, you know, remember how we were like, we just have to vote in numbers too big to manipulate. There's just so many voter suppression laws going on right now that we have to fight these things in court. And that's what Mark Elias and his group are doing. So big, big hats off to them. All right. We have a lot of good news to get to, but we need to take a quick break first. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right Hey, everybody, it's AG, and I want to check in with y'all about Netroots Nation. You might remember I mentioned last month I'm excited to be going to Chicago July 13th through the 15th for Netroots Nation. This is the largest gathering of progressive activists in the country. It happens every year in a different place, and this year it's in the fantastic city of Chicago, one of my favorite places, and you should come too. Netroots Nation is part learning about issues, part skills building, part rallying the folks who do the work, and part fun. Some people come for their jobs. Lots of people come because they just care a lot about what citizens can contribute to politics. For everybody there, it's eye-opening, inspiring, and a chance to connect. The organizers just announced the agenda of training sessions to help you be more effective in the activism you do. You should check it out. It's at the Netroots Nation website, which is netrootsnation.org. There's one on relational organizing that I think might appeal to Beans listeners. You know, vote blue and take someone with you. Sound familiar? There'll be broadcasters and podcasters set up at Media Row where I'll be and at the convention and maybe we'll run into each other there. I'll probably be doing some interviews with folks that I meet. I know it'll be great. I'll update you on planning for Netroots as we get closer, including info about keynote speakers. And remember, Netsroot Nation organizers have given us a discount code. Just enter promo code DAILYBEANS, all one word, to get 10% off the price of your ticket. They've got a discounted hotel block too. So go to netrootsnation.org and register so that we know you're coming. Hi, I'm Moji Alawodeyal from the Feminist Buzzkills Live Pod, the only podcast that helps you navigate the news in this post-pro anti-abortion hellscape. Each week with co-hosts Marie Kahn and Liz Winstead, we dissect all the news from that sketchy intersection of abortion and misogyny with providers and activists working on the ground. The cherry on top is we have amazing comedy guests who help us laugh through the rage. Feminist Buzzkills Live drops Fridays wherever you pod. Listen and subscribe, because when BS is popping, we pop off. Just in and so good. Thousands of summer deals at your Nordstrom Rack Store. Save big on the season's best new arrivals. From Free People, Adidas, Kurt Geiger London, Steve Madden, and more. Starting at just $30. Seriously. So, rack your look for summer. Score great brands and great prices at Nordstrom Rack today. Hurry in and get first dibs on the sun-ready styles you want. From just $30 at your Nordstrom Rack Store. What will you find? Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone.
Good news, good news. And if you have any good news or confessions or corrections, what the mutt, cats in boxes, cats sitting on electronics to keep their booties warm, frog orgies, baby pictures, shout out to a loved one, shit kids say, shit you say, shit your parents say. I got a lot of shit. I got a lot of, a lot shit, of my shit. Mom says a lot of shit. <laughs> a lot of shit. Um, a shout out to an adoptable pet in your area, or a small business that you want to support, or your own business. Anything you want to send us, send it to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Dana, you get to go first today. Of course I do because you guys plan this because there's some things at the beginning I'm not going to be able to pronounce correctly. All right, this is from Jennifer. Pronoun she and her. Ready, everyone? Here we go. Hedge vakra. Drokningar of Bonorna, which means hello, beautiful queens of the beans in Swedish. That probably wasn't even close, and that's okay. As a former Rocky Horror Picture Show devotee, your pronunciation of Democles, let's say it again, Democles. Democles made me laugh. So this is a shared giggle and not a correction. DG, if you've seen Rocky Horror Picture Show, and yes, I have a long time ago, you have heard of the sort of Democles. It is Rocky's, the monster, with half of Eddie's brain. It's the first song. Ah. Ah. I will never not th- think of Democles when I see it now. <laughs> but I'm a weirdo who loves silly wordplay like that. Thank you very much. I spoonerized all the time as a kid, turning fudge marble ice cream into marble, uh, excuse me, into mudge farble. And my silly family adopted it. We'll save the story of the pet potato cake named Lassiter for another time. Um, I am looking forward to the story of the pet I, potato cake. It's I like know. a spaghetti squash story. Okay. Attaches a picture of my spinning from Tour de Fleece day two for 2023. Thank you for all you do. Tour this de is, Fleece. I love it. I know. Good start on the gray mystery wool. Democles. Democles. <laughs> Dude, spoonerisms, uh, Jennifer. My dad did those all the time. He would read me my stories to put me to sleep when I was very little, um, like Rindersella and her sisty uglers, that in spoonerisms. But um, oh, there you go. Yeah. And it, it's a kind of a big thing too at like Renaissance festivals. Huzzah, you get the spoonerisms guy that comes out and does that. But my dad would read me those stories like that. He was Wait, also really- say that again? What? <laughs> I just knew you didn't say anything wrong. I just want to hear about these Renaissance festivals again. Huzzah. Huzzah. Yeah. Huzzah. Okay. <laughs> you know, get a bodice and, you know, jam your tits up into your chin. It's a fun time. And my bodice? Yeah, and your bodice. Um, <laughs> and then you can have a flagon of ale, uh, grog or whatever. You got to stop. I'm getting turned on. Yeah, nerd alert. Uh, but spoonerisms are big there. And then, uh, yeah, my dad was like super into that. And Pig Latin, too. He was really big into Pig Latin. Anyway, next up from Anna Marie, pronoun she and her, dear AGDG and the Beans team. I have good news, but first I was listening to the interview with Ben LeBolt on today's Beans, and it brought to mind a hole in the public service loan forgiveness program that most people probably don't know about. I received my master's degree and teaching certificate back in 2011. At that time, in Oregon, a master's degree was required even for substitute teachers, and I still have a sizable chunk of student debt from my master's program. I've been a substitute teacher most of the years since 2011, and I love it. I feel like an essential part of the education community, offering coverage when full-time teachers need days off or when they're away from their classrooms on school business. Why then was I denied by the um, public student loan forgiveness program when I applied last year? It's because even though I work full-time, I am a part-time employee for two employers that serve public schools in my area, one which would qualify me for PSLF only if I were full-time, and one that is a company some districts in my area outsource substitute teaching to. It is not even a PSLF-eligible employer because it's a private corporation. I feel like the Biden administration would remedy this hole in PSLF qualification if they knew about it, and I'm hoping someone in the Beans community with White House connections, like me, (laughs) <laughs> but put a bug in the right ear. Hint, hint, Anna Marie says. You know, I will send this to my friends. Now for my good news. A few months ago, I heard of a job opening that would be perfect for me. We're taking dream, we're talking dream job level of perfect. So wondering if I was crazy for wanting to give up substitute teaching with no lesson planning or homework and all the flexibility it has. In order to go into full-time classroom teaching as a high school Spanish teacher, I applied. Y'all, I got the job. Hell yeah. Start in August, and I'm just so excited. I can't stop planning ahead, uh, planning in my head all the fun things I'm going to do with these classes. I feel like Pinocchio when he says, I'm a real boy. 
Sadly, in another 10 years, when I'm eligible for PSLF as a full-time district employee, I'll probably no longer need loan forgiveness. <laughs> oh, jeez. Now for pet tax. Meet sweet Houdini, our escape artist. She enjoys being outside. She does not pose for pictures. And if she can see the bottom of a food bowl peeking out through her kibbles even a little, she will loudly let us know what a crisis she thinks that is and demand that we top it off. Here she is, refusing to pose, as she waits impatiently for me to open the door and let her out. She's not amused. Thank you for all you do, especially for making it possible for the wonderful community of Beans patrons and listeners to form. I've been listening since the kitchen table days, and I know lots of us have come through the former guy's administration with a lot more hope because we've had you each, uh, you and each other along the way. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a wonderful submission. And congratulations on all of that. Heck yeah, dream job. Look at the kitty. I love it. All right. So sweet. Kitty, kitty. Okay. This is from Deborah, pronoun she and her. Hey there, beans. I really have anything to submit since I don't have pets, blue tape squares, humping frogs, and I'm decades past the baby business. I do, however, hope you'll remind your listeners of these two very important elections coming up in the states that could use all hands on deck to save our democracy and put the MAGA extremist in the shithouse where they belong. People can go to swingleft.com to get involved or get more information. August is Protect Democracy in Ohio and November. Okay. Love you all. Thank you, Deborah. Yes, everybody, swingleft.com. Get involved. These mid mid elections are super important uh, as well. So uh, I love that though. I don't have pets or blue tape squares or humping frogs. <laughs> That's so good. Babies. Next up from Max, pronouns he and him. Hello, dear queens of the Illuminati. Thank you, as always, for the brilliant, informative podcast with appropriate swearing. Hearing about churches that make their constituents choose between their gender identity and their religious affiliation just makes me mad. All the more, I just had to show you this. From a congregation in Schoenberg, Berlin, Germany, the pride flags really caught my attention, and it's a good idea for other progressive churches. Keep on doing what you do, and take us through the age of indictments and accountability. Oh, good look. Oh, man. I love that flag. It's I love um, it too. That's awesome. It's the full pride flag, and it just says amen on it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, AG, for that one. Lori, pronoun she and her. Hi, impressive women. My dogs have asked me to pass on their celebration of pride pictures wearing their rainbow visors. My little guy, Wrigley, he's a terrier mix, was found by a friend of a friend about five years ago in a box next to a dumpster and rescued, but unfortunately his mom and another pup in the box didn't survive. Melly is the blonde, also a terrier mix, and acts like a pointer when I get the occasional rattlesnake in my yard, as one does Fiona, the one-eyed pug, hell yeah, who I call the spin dog tur, hilarious, <laughs> gets excited especially when she hears the intro to your podcast, but unlike a figure skater, she spins but can't stop the spin without an assist from me. <laughs> oh my God. And Barley, her tail is named Corn. I named all the dog's tails, by the way. Can't, uh, can't see too well and is hard of hearing, but still very playful. All the rescues and pugs came from Aparn, A A P A R N, which is Arizona Pug Rescue and Adoption. I have voted blue since my earliest memories of being in a voting booth with my mom, holding onto her leg as a tiny tot. Thanks for all your informative podcasts and advocacy. Yeah, I was wondering about the rattlesnake in the yard. I'm like, she from Phoenix. She from Arizona. Oh, yeah. Look at the blip. Oh. On the one-eyed pug. Oh, my God. Oh, God. In the next pictures. <gasps> Those I are love them. Puppies I love the them. Ears. I love them. That looks like the tramp on the right. Oh, so cute. How dare you? Oh, right. Yes. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Next up from Craig S. Pronouns he and him. Oh, it's a baby picture, Dana. Oh, I see it. Oh, my God. And that's a baby picture with a puppy. I've been a fan of all the MSW shows since the beginning. I always think of things to send in, but for some reason I never do. That ends today. All right, Craig. My summer resolution is to share more with the Leguminati community. A couple years ago, when my daughter was five, I was driving her home from school when we saw a bird. She asked what kind it was, and I said, it looks like a seagull. She sat straight up, all excited, and proclaimed, the shaved seagull is a symbol of our country. (laughs) She she had been learning about the United States and confused it with the bald eagle, the shaved seagull. (laughs) Naturally, I laughed and said, that's exactly right. Here are some pics of her petting puppies when she was a baby. They're life-alteringly cute. 
Thanks and love to you all. Yeah. (gasps) The second one. There's three or four puppies around this sweet baby. Okay, so that's a little baby with a pink. Oh my God. No, there's five now in the next picture. The puppies just, there's more and more. There's six in the next picture. I lied. (gasps) Oh my God. That warms my heart and my ovaries. Thank you so very much. Oh, Craig, so good. Back, you, what, you've been holding out on us, Craig, this whole yeah. time. This is the first time you, you need to start writing in more. Um, we're going to need more photos from you. What a look at that little angel with the puppies. Oh my God. So, so cute. sweet. Thank you, everybody, for sending your good news on this hot dog day, this 4th of July. Uh, we really appreciate you. And thanks to our patrons. You make this show possible. Seriously, we couldn't do it without you. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here today? No, just sending love to everyone. I know things are a little crazy in the country right now. So just enjoy each other, send love and hug the people that are important to you. Trust me, because life can be short. Um, We find that out all too often. Yes. Big hugs to everyone. And um, tomorrow should be interesting. It's a holiday, so I'm not sure how much news we're going to be able to get, but... uh, We'll see. We we we. I remember when Jack Smith wrote a letter on Thanksgiving. So anything can happen still, and we'll talk to you about it tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone with you, Ohio. Yes, Ohio. I've been H E, and I've been D G, and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill, with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane, with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. You voted. I did. You protested. Again. You postcarded. So many Sundays. You posted on social media. Got some likes. And you're still reeling from all the terrible news. Yeah, but what else can I do? I'm Kelly. I'm Lila. And we're going to help you figure that out. Each week, we'll interview people on the front lines of political action about the things they actually did to take action. What got them started, who helped them along the way, and what they'd do differently if they had it to do all over again. And in the process, we'll give you concrete advice about how to take the leap from freaking out on Twitter to making a difference. Follow What Can I Do wherever you listen to podcasts or tune in on whatcanidopodcast.com. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Feds favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond, plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts.